view at the very top? I, I could zoom, right? Or you could hit view at the very top and it shows a full screen option. This view. Oh, this view. Automatically resize. Slideshow would probably be the best option, I guess. Never mind. Well, let's see. We can make it bigger by hitting this. Yeah, there you go. What do you think? Yeah. Just go back to where I was before I suppose. Just I don't know how to go back. Just hit the X. The what X? Oh, that X. Yeah, that's better. So just, yeah, I think you're right. It is better. Zoom and... Here, maybe I can get rid of this sidebar. There. thought, I think we went through the QED part, so let me do the QCD part. And um, all right, so let's see. Um, somehow, it seems to me that other people get sharper images. All right. Well, anyway, let, let's let's get back to the physics. Sorry. So um, here we've got um, quantum chromodynamics and the cubic interaction of the gauge field, the gauge field, um, the f mu nu, is the ordinary term plus essentially a commutator of f mu with f nu. And the cubic term there gives rise to um, uh, a running coupling constant that decreases with rising energy. And if you compute, um, let me write on the, I couldn't figure out how to do Feynman diagrams. So if you, if we're looking at this, you've got, um, sorry, this is a gauge boson loop. So that's, that's the big term. And then there's another term, which is the ghost loop. And the sum of these two gives you um, the expression out there. If you want, we can go through that computation at some point. But I thought I'd just um, tell you what the result is here. It's um, <coughs> the, the computation of these things actually gets a little complicated. Um, Anyway, so then uh, d, 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 g mu, d, d mu times mu, which is the beta function, is negative because of this minus sign there. And uh, so you integrate from one energy scale to another, and uh, then you invert, and what you find is um, you find that uh, g e squared is g m squared divided by 1 plus 11 gm squared over 8 pi squared log of e over m. This is with no fermions. And, and the, 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 the lingo is when you have the theory without any fermions, you call it a pure gauge theory. Um, and this, the fact that the coupling constant goes down logarithmically as the energy increases, going to zero actually at infinite energy is an effect called asymptotic freedom. Um, okay, now, if the gauge group, so I was doing this for SU3, and one of the characteristics of SU3 is that it gives you an 11 there, and um, people in the trade think of it as uh, significant that you get a prime number there, okay. or a, a non-trivial prime number, that is say not 2 or 3, but actually 11. Um, if you're dealing with SUN and you have NF flavors of quarks, move the mouse back here. 
All right, so if you have um, NF flavors of quarks with masses below mu, then the beta function changes a little bit, and the, the uh, well, the extra diagram, of course, is a quark-anti-quark -quark pair, and um, that then subtracts something from the uh, from the negative. It makes the beta function more positive, but it still remains negative as long as the number of quark, light quark flavors is less than 11 n over 2, and n is typically 3, so we're talking 33 over 2 as long as it's less than 17. Um, if you use the beta function, this beta function with n equals 3, and you integrate, instead of the top thing, you instead find this. And um, so then I actually plotted that. Um, in fact, well, let, let's do a, a few more manipulations. If you, if you first set, um, define lambda squared, as this mass squared e to the minus 16 pi squared over 11 minus 2 nf over 3 gm squared, then, uh, and in fact, why don't we assign that as a homework problem? It's not a hard homework problem. You then find that this previous formula, that, uh, that one, in other words, now becomes Now it becomes this formula down here. So now alpha s at energy squared e, and alpha is the coupling constant squared divided by 4 pi, just as the fine structure constant is e squared over 4 pi. Um, so that's g e squared over 4 pi. It turns out to be 12 pi over 33 minus 2 nf log of e squared over lambda squared. And that's what I've plotted here. Notice what's happened. You've got now. On the right hand side, you have the coupling at energy E is defined in terms of the energy E and a, an energy scale lambda given by this expression. And um, people um, make sort of a big deal about this. They call it dimensional transmutation in the sense that you replace the dimensionless coupling constant with a dimension full coupling constant, but of course you have to have that because if you're going to have a running coupling constant at energy E and the whole thing is dimensionless, then it has to depend upon a ratio of E to some other energy scale, lambda. And um, so that's, that's the, way it, the way it is. And uh, that's been called dimensional transmutation. That is to say you go from a dimensionless to a dimension full. Coupling. In other words, the coupling alpha at E is given by this expression, uh, again, to one loop order, um, and it's defined entirely in terms of this coupling kind of, of this energy scale lambda. It turns out that energy scale is approximately 250 MeV, uh, and the coupling, the strong coupling constant, or the strong structure constant, uh, alpha s of e then, as given by this expression, looks like this, as you take energies from somewhat larger than the, 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 the bottom <coughs> quark uh, up to somewhat less than the top quark energy. So this energy range, frankly, it's in the middle, basically, where it's most valid. And um, for lambda, in, in that energy range, the number of light quarks is five up, down, charm, strange, and bottom. And uh, if, if lambda is 250 MeV, then you get us approximately the right answer. Now, there are higher order loop corrections, of course, and they have been actually worked out. By the way, the bottom quark is 4.19 Jeb, and the top quark around 172. Um, so I, uh, I tried to put in Weinberg's um, uh, corrections, uh, but um, I, I don't know, I must have fumbled some left parenthesis or something because the curve just didn't look as good as this one. 
All right, are there any questions? <coughs> I think um, I've got to give everybody a candy because of just forgetting the, uh, getting the, getting the uh, electricity going. Let me, um, let me now, I think we've done the lattice field theory thing uh, enough. Let me review the um, renormalization group in condensed matter. Um, because uh, I, uh, I'm not happy with the way I did it last time. And um, I want to show you how it goes if you're, if you're careful. So this is, once again, that's awfully fuzzy. There's no way of making that clear. Maybe you can choose another resolution. Yeah. All right, well, let's. Are you happy with this resolution or should I try something else? Looks good to me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, because you're, you're at a greater distance. Yeah. All right, so let's. Um, let, let me just go through the condensed matter spiel carefully. I, I think this is um, a better way of doing it than what I did last time. Basically, you're going to. You're concerned in condensed matter with the properties that emerge in the bulk. Um, that is to say, when you're at a distance scale, which is much bigger than the distance between the molecules and the crystal or the liquid or the gas, whatever the bulk is. So we're looking at things like melting point, boiling point, conductivity. We want to see what happens to the physics as we increase the distance scale many orders of magnitude beyond the size of an individual molecule distance between nearest neighbors. So we're going to take, we're going to imagine that we're doing this in terms of a Euclidean action in d dimensions, and it's going to look like that. Um, uh, and one can think of uh, this sum as a sum, and the first one might be a mass term, the next one a normal quartic interaction, and then a whole host of, of terms there. Um, so what um, what do we do? Well, we're going to th th there's going to be a an ultraviolet cutoff uh, one over a, and um, we can define a field with that ultraviolet cutoff in this way, and, 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 and the, the Fourier coefficients will only go up to lambda. And now what we're going to do is we're going to, with each such field, we're path integrating over all these fields with uh, an ultraviolet cutoff. And that cutoff, of course, the natural lambda would be 1 over the lattice space, you can say. Um, corresponding to each such field, we're going to introduce a stretch field, phi sub L of x. And that's going to be some a sub a of L times phi of x over L. And we're thinking of L greater or equal to 1. So we're trying to look at the look at this partition function for fields that, that have been stretched out, keeping the same k less than lambda limit there. And uh, a, a of L is a scale factor we're going to choose and um, in order to keep the kinetic part of the action invariant. So A sub L is A of L, phi of x over L, that's A of L, and then I'm just substituting in here. The um, x over L comes out there, but that's the same thing as changing effectively change, uh, reducing the momentum by a factor of 1 over L. In any event, we can, we can talk about a new partition function, which we can write this way, as uh, an integral over the stretched fields. And now the kinetic action of the stretched field, well, it's 1 half, we bring out the A of L, and then it's the derivative squared, and of course, what I want to do is ch change variables completely to x over L. So I go to dd of x over L. I, that brings out, to cancel the d factors of 1 over L, I pull out L to the d, the, there's a squared. And then here, the derivative with respect to x over L, to cancel the 1 over L, I have, have an L here. Altogether, this thing will be independent the, the, the kinetic action will look right 
if we set A of L to be L to the minus D minus 2 over 2. And uh, then we'll set X prime equal to X over L, and then this, the, the kinetic part of the action is D, D, X prime 1 half partial of F of X prime with X prime squared, which is exactly what we want. Then the total action, um, dropping the primes on the X's, is going to be of um, this form in which G N of L, well, what is it? Well, there's an L to the D that comes out from here. Then there's going to be A of L to the N times G of N. And if you just do the arithmetic, that's L to the D minus N, D minus 2 over 2. Um, so let's see. What's, what's next? Um, one can define the beta function that is uh, in the normal way is uh, basically 1 over G, L, D, G, D, L. That's the way they do it in condensed matter physics. And then that, it, that then is just the exponent of the running coupling constant G of L. And so what you see is if, if the beta function is positive, then the coupling constant gets stronger as we go to bigger distances. And those couplings are called relevant from the point of view of condensed matter. If the thing is, if this vanishes, the beta function vanishes, then, um, then the, the, the uh, couplings are marginal because they're insensitive to L. And if, they ha if it's negative, then the um, couplings shrink with increasing L and they're uh, irrelevant. So um, I think that's, um, that's about it for um, for the renormalization group. I, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, we could do the computation in SU3 if you want. It, it, one reason to do it is that we did go to the trouble to derive the action with the ghost fields at, at either the end of last semester or the beginning of this, I don't quite remember. Um, now, um, I looked at, 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 at Michael Kreutz's um, uh, C code for Z2. And um, what I found was that A, it works, which isn't surprising. Um, and um, I then uh, uh, ran it to exhibits the thermal cycle, which shows the phase transition for Z2 in four dimensions. And I thought it would be good for you to use his code. It's on the web page. Compile it, run it, and then um, man, uh, manipulate it so as to, to, to exhibit the, uh, the coexistence of two phases. He basically um, well, one of the things that I downloaded and put on the web page is his, is a lecture he gave at a Gordon conference, and he talks about various projects. So the second project was to um, exhibit the coexisting phases. And what you can do is you can take his program and you just modify it in rather simple ways. Um, do uh, say a cold start and um, compute the action a hundred times. Uh, or update the action a hundred times, um, then do a random stop, update the action a hundred times. And if you do this with the coupling constant, it's the critical coupling constant, which is, um, as I recall, it's a half, this is beta t, is a half, um, I think it's one plus, one plus root two. Anyway, it's whatever it is, and um, it's 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 of the order of zero point four four. Um, if you do it there, then what happens with random starts, a hundred updates, they're all at a certain uh, in a certain range of about point three or something. And if you do it with a cold start and a hundred updates, they're all up at about point eight or point nine. And so that shows you that you've got, you can have two phases coexisting at this point. Um, 
So I guess that means that what you have is you have a sudden phase transition when you can have two phases coexisting. Another way of saying that you have two, seeing that you have two phase coexisting is to do the first project, which is to say you, you start out with a cold, you do a cold start with all the, and he has a, a subroutine, you just call it cold start. And, uh, it, uh, and then you warm the thing up a hundred times and you see the action go down and then you start cooling it down and you see, you see the hysteresis loop. The hysteresis loop is an indication that there's a sudden phase transition. Um, okay, I was going to show you those things, but um, I haven't installed a new plot on this, and so I don't quite know how to do that. So I think what I'm going to do now is um, basically turn on the lights and tell you something about Goldstone's theorem and um, spontaneous symmetry breaking and uh, so forth. Um, uh, so I'm going to start writing on that part of the board down there. And if, if, um, if we're lucky, I'll be able to do everything without having to use this side of the room. Inserting one in 
plus one times. However, if the charge annihilates the vacuum, then this we can replace this term by just vacuum. And then we have e to the i theta q, a of x1, e to the minus i theta q, dot, 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 e to the i theta q, a of xn, e to the minus i theta q, uh, vacuum. So in other words, if q annihilates the vacuum, then we can, re this term has no effect on the vacuum. We just go to that, and similarly, this term on the vacuum has no effect. And now we can say that, that this is zero a theta of x1, a theta of x2, a theta of xn, is the same as the undisturbed fields, and that's what we mean by a symmetry. So if Q annihilates the vacuum, there's a symmetry. And by the way, in the case of supersymmetry, um, the Hamiltonian, and I'm going to be a little bit sloppy here, the Hamiltonian is basically Q dagger Q. In fact, it's sort of an anti-commutator of Q dagger Q. So the fact that the, so if the, the supercharge annihilates the vacuum, then H annihilates the vacuum, and that means that it's a ground state of zero energy. That's an unbroken supersymmetry. It's one of the things people like about the supersymmetry. Unfortunately, well, anyway, let's forget about the supersymmetry for a moment. So the question now is, what happens? Goldstone's theorem is, cons is concerned with what happens if Q does not annihilate the vacuum. In other words, we have a conserved current. Q commutes with the Hamiltonian. There's a conserved current. This is Q, but it doesn't annihilate the vacuum. An example of that, let me just give an example of that. Suppose you're, you have a potential, suppose you have a theory where phi is phi 1, phi 2. And the potential is such that the minimum of the potential, instead of being at phi equal to zero, is a circle in phi one, phi two space. So this is phi one, phi two. Then, um, what does this charge do? Well, this charge will basically move you around the circle. And, and so the vacuum state is over here. It's essentially the core roughly a coherent state at that position. And then the charge just rotates you around here. It doesn't annihilate the state. And um, so that's called, that's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. So we don't have the symmetry, but we still have the conserved current. And um, what you can think of is that you have a symmetric set of vacua, and the system picks one. And um, effectively, the vacuum then breaks the symmetry. Okay. All right, well, Goldstone's theorem is remarkably simple. Uh, first of all, we add a constant to the Hamiltonian so that um, H annihilates the vacuum. We then consider this state, since Q on the vacuum isn't zero, HQ is something. And what is it? Well, we can write it as H commutator Q because H annihilates the vacuum. Okay, so this, in other words, is HQ minus QH. That's Writing it this way, h on 0 is 0, and so this commutator just gives us hq on the vacuum. But this has to be 0. 
So in other words, the state Q0 is a state of zero energy. And now we can define a related state K, which is integral dQx e to the minus i k dot x. This is a spatial integral, j0 of x and t, <coughs> vacuum. And um, this clearly goes to q0 as k goes to 0, because in the limit k going to 0, this is gone, and this integral of j0 is just q. So this is just q on the vacuum. Um, on the other hand, the momentum operator, pi on k, well, we can write that as d cubed x e to the minus i k dot x. Now, pi on the vacuum is zero because the momentum is a conserved operator that generates a symmetry and so annihilates the vacuum equivalent to the vacuum is translational invariant. And so we can rewrite this as pi g0 of x, the commutator, on the vacuum. On the other hand, pi generates translations, and so this is integral d cubed x e to the minus i k dot x. Um, and then this is minus i di j0 of x and t vacuum. Now we integrate by parts, and as usual in this whole game of symmetry we drop surface terms. And um, so this then gives us um, I integral dq x, j0 of x and t, <coughs> di e to the minus i k dot x vacuum, and then that is just k sub i the state k. This, this, the i's cancel, you just get a k, and then what's left is just the definition of the state k. So what we have then is a set of states of momentum k that have zero energy in the limit k going to zero. That's what we mean by a zero mass state. The zero mass state is a uh, state belongs to a family of momentum eigenstates, and when the momentum goes to zero, the energy goes to zero. So there's a zero mass state, and since we've assumed Q is a boson, it's a boson. I suppose we could go through this whole business with a fermionic charge, and um, uh, I suppose we'd use a Grassmann theta or something. And um, I don't see anything that would prevent us to have a Goldstone fermion uh, for the case in which a fermionic charge is spontaneous, a, fermi uh, a fermionic symmetry is spontaneous to both. Okay, now an example of this, the famous example of this is, um, well, let me just do this in more detail, and then I'll shift to uh, the Anderson Higgs mechanism. So suppose L is a half, um, we can write this as d phi transpose d phi plus mu squared over 2 phi transpose phi minus lambda over 4 phi transpose phi where here we're, I'm, I'm saying phi is phi 1, phi 2. If we switch to a complex, oh, look, first before I do that, mu squared normally, well, Roger and after all, is the kinetic term minus the potential. So if mu squared comes in with a plus sign, it has the wrong sign. <clears throat> so the potential looks essentially like this. The minimum goes around here, and then it goes back up like this. And uh, so it's, people describe it as a Mexican hat potential. It's looking like that, so the minimum is down there. <laughs> now, it's easier if we 
we, we say here this thing has an O2 symmetry if we instead define a complex field phi equal to phi 1 plus i phi 2 over root 2 if I'm not mistaken, let me make sure, yeah. 1 over root 2 and then we can rewrite this as rho of x e v i theta of x then the space. The Lagrange density then is uh, now d phi star or d phi dagger, I don't know how we want to write it, <coughs> plus u squared phi dagger phi minus lambda phi dagger phi squared, say, effectively. And um, now what is d mu phi? Well, d mu phi is d mu rho e the i theta, and so this is d mu rho plus i rho d mu theta e the i theta, and so what we're running here is uh, rho squared d theta squared plus d rho squared plus u squared rho squared minus lambda rho to the fourth. So the theta field is massless, but, um, and the rho field looks as though it has an imaginary mass, but if instead we define v to be the radius of this minimum, and that turns out to be mu over the square root of two lambda, and then we, we write rho equals v plus i. Then what happens is this Lagrangian can be written as v squared d theta squared. So it's still massless. But now this, the chi field, which is the vibrational, in other words, rho is a mean value plus a vibration. And this will be d chi squared minus 2 mu squared chi squared and then minus 4 root mu squared lambda over 2 chi cubed minus lambda chi fourth uh, plus root 2 mu squared over lambda chi plus chi squared <coughs> d theta squared, and then there's another term, minus lambda p to the fourth, which is just a constant. So what we've got here is a massless field and a massive field. Now the mu has the right sign once we've shifted rho, and uh, so chi has mass mu. Because you see, the normal way it would be written would be a one half here. So if we multiply both terms by one half, then this becomes a. Oh wait, this becomes a mu. All right, it's probably mu times root two. Anyway, it's proportional to mu. Minus two might be root two. So this is the nam theta is the Nambu Goldstone boson. That, that's the field that represents it. Now, it turns out that this happens as long as the number of space-time dimensions is bigger than two. When it's just two, well, we can look at it, the propagator. And let's now go back to the rectangular notation where we have phi one this way, phi two that way. Phi one is caught in this potential, so it it's caught in the potential there, so it doesn't move, but there's no restraining force in the phi two direction. So the question is, do you have crazy vibrations in that direction or not? And so what we do is we look for the propagator phi two of x, phi two of zero. And of course that's going to be essentially an integral d d x over 2 pi to the d 
Ti kx over, it's massless, so it's k squared. And now, we're going to cope with the ultraviolet divergence with, uh, with renormalization from some sort of cutoff. But on the other hand, there's an infrared divergence. So the infrared divergence, um, when is that? And um, well, if d is 3 or greater than this, oh. This is k, we're in momentum space. So if, if, if this is 3, then we would have k squared dk, and there's no problem. But if it's, if d is 2, it's k dk, and so it's dk over k, that's a log divergence. So there's a log, in two dimensions, you have log divergences, both that, both ultraviolet and infrared, and um, so there's an infrared divergence. That means that this field phi 2 can just wildly oscillate in the 2 direction and that means then that this analysis isn't really valid in two dimensions. So you basically don't get spontaneous, uh, you don't get um, uh, you don't get the spontaneous breakdown of symmetry if d is less than, less than or equal to 2. So if d less than or equal to 2, no spontaneous symmetry break. This was worked out independently by Coleman and Merman and uh, somebody else. All right, so that's that. Now let's um, turn to what's called the Anderson-Higgs mechanism, which is to say, what happens if you gauge this field? In other words, if you have to gauge theory, rather than simply a, uh, an ordinary theory. And so what we're going to do then is we're going to say that L is minus a quarter F mu nu F mu nu plus D phi dagger D phi plus mu squared phi dagger phi minus lambda phi dagger phi squared. So that's uh, our picture. And we're going to say d mu phi is d mu minus i e a mu phi. All right, so we've got a covariant derivative there. And we can set phi equal to rho e to the i. Rho e to the i theta is what that's supposed to be. So we let phi be rho e to the i theta. Then this thing is d mu rho plus i rho d mu theta minus p a mu e to the i theta. And uh, so this Lagrange density is we can write as minus a quarter f nu, f nu plus rho squared d mu theta minus e a mu squared plus d rho squared plus mu squared rho minus lambda rho four. So that's what we're dealing with. And now this b mu, let's define b mu as a mu minus 1 over e d mu theta. And if we do that, then this term here, first of all, f mu nu can be written as, which is of course d mu a nu minus d nu a mu. It's the same thing as d mu b nu minus d nu b mu because um, the derivative, you'll have just d nu d mu minus d mu d nu on theta, and that cancels. And so 
this thing is BMU squared. It wants you to pull out a, um, an E. And uh, so L so this Lagrangian then is minus a quarter F mu nu F mu nu plus a half and now it'll be M squared B mu squared where M is equal to um, Let's see, one half, this will pull out an E, so it's rho squared, E squared, and to make it one half, I guess I could make that be a two. And then, um, right, okay. And so what we've got then is a massive, a massive bos a vector boson, B mu. This is Lagrange density for a massive vector boson. Um, interacting with, the rest of this is E squared V chi B mu squared, but that's interacting with the scalar field chi. Um, oh, and of course what we've said was here that rho is 1 over root 2 V plus chi, where V is mu over square root of lambda. Then this thing is interacting with chi. Chi is then the vibrational part of rho. Rho is assuming a value equal to v over root 2, I guess. And um, the other terms are plus a half e squared chi squared b mu squared. This is again an interaction term. Plus a half d mu chi squared minus mu squared chi squared. Well, this means that chi has mass mu. And then there are other interaction terms, square root of lambda, mu, chi cubed, minus lambda over 4, chi to the 4, plus mu to the 4th over 4 lambda. I actually think that might be a minus, but um, anyway, let's just, yeah, it's certainly a minus. Um, so what's happened is that the, the, the massive, the massless field A mu has become a massive field B mu. And um, this mechanism was found in condensed matter physics by Anderson, and it was found in, um, in quantum field theory by Higgs. And uh, quantum field theory called the Higgs mechanism. And this is supposed to be how um, the gauge boson, why the W and the Z are massive. Um, and uh, so if one works this, this out for um, the electroweak theory, um, this is the mechanism that takes place and uh, the W and the Z become massive and the, um, the photon remains massless. What's actually happening is that the, there are actually, you have a gauge field with SU2, SU2 cross U1. That's the symmetry that's spontaneously broken. And um, so you have four gauge bosons here. Two of them, W plus or minus, get a mass directly in this way. Then there are two others. The third what you can think of as W3, and then what's normally called B that generates the U1. You can then take two orthogonal linear combinations of those fields. One gets a mass and becomes a Z, the other one stays massive and becomes a photon. In Gramley unified theories, you extend this group. Well, of course, you add SU3, but then you add other stuff. And uh, all together, this is part of a group called SU5. And then you have spontaneous symmetry breakdown for SU5. And um, the breakdown is such that at, at the breakdown is at a very high scale around 10 to the 15th GeV. So that the, the gauge bosons that generate SU5, but not 
SU2 cross SU3 cross U1, they get masses of the order of 10 to the 15th jet. And um, then there's a second breakdown of the electroweak scale that gives masses of the W and Z. And all of it works basically on the same Anderson Higgs mechanism. Um, okay. Now, um, let's see if um, we can see how this will work in a slightly more general case. Suppose instead of having two real fields, which is what we had here, suppose we have three. So now this is phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. And um, once again, the, the potential would be some lambda phi transpose phi squared minus some mu squared phi transpose phi. If that's the potential, then um, what you have is that uh, phi, the, the length of phi has to be essentially, um, uh, what is it? Uh, lambda length of phi squared is equal to mu squared. So it's essentially mu over the square root of lambda. So this, that, that, it has to take that size. But then there are, um, so what do we have? What we have then is this sphere and the radial vibrations of the, of this field, those are constrained to be small because of the potential. And so the you get one massive uh, scalar boson. And here I'm doing this before it's gauged. So this is just an O3 symmetry. O zone. And two massless scalar bosons. So this gives you two Goldstone bosons because the ones that can go in the directions, suppose these, suppose the vacuum is here, then the directions perpendicular on the surface of the sphere are correspond to massless vibrations. Now, if you gauge the whole thing, then um, you would gauge this with, um, let's see, this, we're talking here then, this is a vector, so this symmetry is O3 or SO3. So we would have three gauge fields, which we might as well call um, W mu. And so for this SO3 case, um, the, the thing would, uh, what you'd wind up with is these two massless bosons would be absorbed by two of the, of the uh, gauge boson, of, of these massless gauge bosons, it would become, and the, those massless, two massless gauge bosons would become massive, and one gauge boson would remain massless. So suppose, in order to see this more explicitly, let's suppose, let's look at what the um, covariant derivative would be. And the covariant derivative d mu of, say, v would be d mu v. This is a triplet of vectors. Um, and it would be minus something like ie uh, ta wa mu. So maybe I should write this. Like that. Okay. And the ta's. Um, would be actually uh, T sub A um, would effectively be um, these, the, these are, it's effectively epsilon ABC. And so let me, let, me, let me see how it would go. T3 would, T3, a, B would be essentially um, epsilon 3, A, B. I'm leaving out the, the, there's an overall minus sign or an I, depending on how you do this. And in fact, 
um, TA, let's put it more generally, TAIJ will be proportional to epsilon AIJ. These are the, with the generators of, S, of, of old SO3 in the adjoint representation. And so now, if you assume that the vacuum is such that um, phi 3 is some V plus some the scale of vibration in the, in the Z direction, and then <coughs> phi 1 and phi 2 um, uh, are, are essentially zero in the, in the vacuum, then we can look at what, what this looks like. Well, this d mu, we would have d mu phi transpose d mu phi and v v the third component of it, in other words, if, if phi is 3, in other words, we would have here phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and then we would have the derivative d mu, and then minus i e um, <coughs> t a w a mu, and these are 3 by 3 matrices, and so Let's look at, say, W1. Then this is T1. And now, this thing is essentially um, epsilon, epsilon, and then a real V. So these are small, and this is V. Um, or maybe I should write it W. w. No, these are five here, so this is, well, let me call it epsilon. And so then, um, this thing, if this is T1, then this is going to have a term W2. This will be like W2 V times E, this E, okay? Because this is an epsilon 1, 3, 2. So you get a W2. <coughs> On the other hand, there will also be a term where this is, when this is a 2 and that's a 1, then you'll get a W1 here, V and um, an E. And so this, this mass term, I mean this, this, this kinetic term then would be V squared, E squared, and it would be W um, mu 1 squared plus W2 so it would look like this. And so the, 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 the two of the gauge bosons would get mass m squared of the order of e squared v squared. And it's, it's just the same as over here, except that I did it. I'm doing it. Uh, rho is, and, and v are the same. I, I don't, I'm not sure we should have had a, well, the mean value of rho is v, so it's the same thing. So, that's, um, that's how the Higgs mechanism works for the case of SO3. And in fact, it's also how it works for the case of SU2, because it's the same, it's, well, it's, it's isomorphic, basically. In any case, two of the three gauge bosons get a mass and the other one doesn't. When you mix in U1, then you get that the W and the Z, one gets a mass, the other one doesn't. Um, So that's, that's basically it. Is the other, the ideas that I presented, I think, um, I want you to understand them, so please ask a question. If there's, if there's something that you don't understand, it's, I, I assure you, it's not deep. Okay, so, if you, and I can clear it up for you in a minute and give you a piece of candy if you ask the question. So if something bothers you, I, I might have made a typo or said something wrong the way I did when I introduced Wilson. Um, so is there something that 
here either on Goldstone's theorem or on this <coughs> and the Anderson Higgs mechanism that you want to get clarified? It appears to make sense. Huh? It appears to make sense. The one, all right, let me tell you um, something that, 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 that I find, a question that I have, in other words, if I were sitting in the class and somebody else were lecture, I'd raise my hand and say, um, we were talking here about a continuous symmetry, and I guess in a sense that um, in the context where we have a conserved current and the charge commutes with the Hamiltonian, then you can get a continuous symmetry the way I did, namely you just exponentiate theta q with an i, and that gives you a u1. Um, but uh, what if the symmetry were discrete rather than continuous? What would happen? Where does this fall apart? And I'm, I'm a, I'm not sure what's going on. Because um, once you have a conserved charge, it obviously generates, if it annihilates the vacuum, it automatically generates a continuous symmetry. So I suppose the question is, what do we say about things like parity or charge conjugation and so forth? Um, well, I don't know. All right, why don't we just quit and let